Why learn JavaScript anyway? Did you ever sit in your comfy couch at your house and wonder, why JavaScript? What can it do for me? Why all the buzz about it? And what is an elephant doing in my living room? If it happens to you, pet your brand new elephant right away. And also, join me in being more knowledgeable about JavaScript. Right off the bat, JavaScript is really cool. You can add logic to your website, make it more interactive, and also manipulate your HTML and CSS due to that logic. But if you thought cool is the only feature of JavaScript, then you're wrong, because JavaScript is also relatively easy, and it's the base of the most popular frameworks out there, such as AngularJS, ReactJS, BackboneJS, Knockout, and even good old jQuery. Wherever you step on the web development world, you'll see the footprints of JavaScript. If you have the desire to be a web developer, then you just have to be familiar with JavaScript. And that's why you are here, right? So I'm glad you are here. Let's get started. What is JavaScript? Here's a person called Bob. Bob has eyes, ears, nose, mouth. He has a body and also some clothes. But until it has a brain that functions everything together, it's only a bunch of organs connected to each other. Just like our weird but beloved Bob, you can surely know HTML and structure huge websites. You can also decorate and style your website with your amazing CSS skills. But if you lack in your JavaScript skills, your web pages will look dull and old. JavaScript is the programming language of the web. It is our functioning brain that keeps everything in touch. If you want your website to be more interactive, so your users could click on one element and be amazed when it actually does something, be sure you have your JavaScript skills well put together. So, sit tight and let us begin. Do I need to know anything before I learn JavaScript? Although it's a JavaScript course, you will need to know at least a little bit of HTML and CSS to understand the course content. I will use several examples that use HTML and CSS, so if you don't know any of those, please go back and strengthen those skills. One more thing. For all my examples in this course, I will use Notepad++, which is a completely free text editor. You can grab it here for free. http colon slash slash notepad dash plus dash plus dot org slash download. However, if you happen to be allergic to my suggestions, you can always try other software as well. I won't judge you. I promise. I will. How to set up your page. All right, all right, all right. You are already sold about learning JavaScript. You are supposed to be set with your Notepad++ and you want to start coding JavaScript, right? Before you do so, you need to set up your page. In order to do so, all you need to do is write inside of your head tag a tag named script, like that. Inside of the script tag, we will have an attribute called type slash JavaScript. That tells the browser we are having a JavaScript typed script. Inside of that tag, you will write your JavaScript code. Simple alert. Write to document. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. Just like a baby trying to walk its first steps, you are about to write your very first JavaScript code. And it's going to contain... Drumroll, please. Printing a fluffy red goat. Why printing a fluffy red goat, you ask? because there is nothing more suspicious than walking down a street and see a person printing goats just for the sake of printing goats. That is, red. And also fluffy. And that's the kind of things we want to associate with these days. Leather jackets and a fluffy red goat. So, how are we going to print our fluffy red goat into our screen? All you need to do is print document, followed by a dot, and then type the word write. Right after that, you will have to open parentheses and close parentheses. Inside of these parentheses, we will have quotation marks. And in the quotation marks, we will write down, I'm printing a fluffy red goat because that's what we do. And in the end, just like any language, if we want to end a sentence, you will write a dot, right? But in JavaScript, we are writing a semicolon. We will save our file and refresh our page and... Oh my, we just printed our very own fluffy red goat. Ah, hack, that's too good to be a singular event. Let's print more of these. Yay, we are having lots of fluffy goats. Okay, okay, 
Now, we want to warn everybody, before we are printing our goats to watch out, fluffy red goats are on the loose, preferably with an annoying pop-up on the screen. So we will write down alert. And then we will open parentheses, and inside our parentheses, we will have double quotation marks as well. And then we will write, watch out, red fluffy goats are on their way. And we will close our statement with a semicolon, as usual. Now save your document and refresh the page, and, oh, I am very impressed by your sort of a road sign thingy warning everybody about what could be the end of time. By the way, did you see that we placed our alert before the document write and refresh the page? The alert showed first, but you didn't see any of the text on your document just yet. That's because JavaScript operates as a queue, first in the first statement, then the second one, and so on. Now you know all about writing and printing in your document and all about annoying pop-ups, as well as all about fluffy red goats. In the next chapter, I'll show you how to write comments. Comments. Shh, I have to tell you a secret. Yesterday, I went to a fortune teller. I sat on the chair and then she approached me and said, Ah, oh, my dearly beloved almighty awesomely humble Gilad, I have to tell you something about your students. And you know me, I care a big deal about my young Padawans, so I asked, What? So she told me, In the near future, they will be working on a project as web developers. And I was shocked. I said, What? Are you sure? My students? So she said, Well, wait, I didn't get to the point yet. And I was like, Oh, yeah, well, carry on. In the near future, they will be working on a project as web developers, and they will be working with other web developers as well. Other web developers? Other? Are you sure? Indeed. So I quickly ran to my office and prepared you this lecture. If you are about to work with other web developers, you will have to communicate with them properly, and there is no better option to do so but with comments. Comments are for your own sole purpose, and for your colleagues as well. You see, comments are not being rendered on the page, so you can write whatever you want, like, Hey Jeff, don't mention about yesterday. I was really hungry, and your computer was the only thing that tastes like chicken. P.S. This line of code is getting everything from the database. So now you know about why you do need comments, but how can we do that? Simply write inside of your script tag two forward slashes and start typing. Like that. Save it, refresh it, and... It's a Christmas miracle. Just like we've expected, nothing renders. Now only me and my colleague Jeff will know about our little incident. But what about if I want to leave Jeff a multi-comment about what I ate for dinner, the list of things I'm allergic to, and why I always laugh like a crazy person when it rains? So in that case, we would have one forward slash followed by a star. We write whatever we want to write, and then close it with a star, and another forward slash. Hopefully, you would not work with Jeff, because he's a handful. But if you would or wouldn't, at least now you know how to write JavaScript comments. Variables Do you remember back in school when your teacher said something along the lines of x equals 98, and then she said something like, Danny just ate x apples. You all knew, you all knew she's talking about Danny that just swallowed 98 apples, right? That's exactly how variables work in JavaScript. JavaScript variables are like little placeholders. They store your data, and then if you want to use that data later, you just call the variable name and use it. So before you will use your variable, you will need to declare a name for it. So to declare a variable, the lazy JavaScript people just shorthand the word variable into just var. So you should always write var first, and then you can come up with every name for your variable. Any name you can think of. I'll write my name, for example, Gilad. Then, you should write an equal sign, and then, what you want to assign your variable to. Let's say we want to print the number 9. 
and we will close it with a semicolon like always. Right now, you already know how to print stuff to your page. Remember our fluffy red goat? So erase the text inside and just write your variable's name. No quotation mark needed. Save it and refresh it. Holy goats! We've got a 9 on our screen. Let's explain what just happened. Your browser, thinking for himself, oh, all right, awesomely cool web developer, you want me to set a variable and then you want to call the variable Gilad. So I'll set a place in my room just for you. And I will call that place Gilad from now on. Then we wrote the equal sign. So that means you set it to whatever on the right side of the equal sign, which is 9. So the computer says, okay, I'll now store 9 in my place called Gilad. And I promise you, I will use it whenever you tell me to use it. Then when we called the Gilad variable inside our document write, the computer took the value and printed it inside of the document. Oh, but one more thing. Do you remember I told you about the name of the variable and that you can name it whatever you like? Well, you can. But you have two rules you have to keep, okay? Rule number one, don't ever write anything funky like that. Pound, five, carat, dollar sign, percent, carat, carat, dollar sign. Your browser will go bananas and wouldn't know what you mean by that name. You can only call your variables by letters, numbers, and underscores. Rule number two, JavaScript is a case-sensitive language, so don't call your variable Jeffrey, all lowercase, and then afterwards call it Jeffrey like a crazy person. For the browser, it's like you would call some girl Hillary and then switch to, Hey, Brittany, sup, Brit, I mean, Doris, Doris, J Jenny, Bath, Elizabeth, Doris, Doris. Yeah, so don't do that. Other than that, you're safe. Variable types. Do you remember when you were a baby, you had this weird game of shape, and you were supposed to sort those shapes and put every shape into its place? Just like that game, JavaScript has different types of variables, and they cannot fit everywhere. Let me explain it to you by first writing it down in our text editor. I will write down var name equals to 9. That's what we've done in the last lecture, right? We have a variable named name, and it's equal to the number 9. But my name is not 9, right? I swear, it's not. Let's try to erase the number 9 and place my name instead. Save it, refresh it, and let's see what we have here. Ah, nothing shows. What happened? The difference between 9 and Gilad is that Gilad is a text, or as JavaScript likes to call it, a string. And 9 is just a number. The thing is, JavaScript could easily think that Gilad may be just another variable. And because it could be a variable, it's trying to look for it in the entire page. And when it couldn't find it, it just says, Whoa, oh, well, all right, I did my best. I cannot find it anywhere, so I'll just do nothing and relax. Giving up early, huh? To say explicitly to JavaScript that we have a string here, we need to wrap our text inside of a quotation mark. Let's do that. Save it, refresh it, and yeah, baby, we've still got it. So now we know that we have two different types of variables, numbers and strings, and the difference between them is that little quotation mark. We have a few more types of variables in JavaScript, and we will cover them in later lectures. Using different types of var. Did you know that JavaScript can do your homework? If I knew that, I would have studied JavaScript when I was five. Here's an example. That could come handy in first grade, don't you think? Hmm, let's try something. I'll declare two vars. The first one I will name num1 and set it to 4, and the second one I will name num2 and set it to the number 2. Now in the document write, I will replace the 3 plus 3 into num1 plus num2 and run it. All right, we've got 6. Awesome. We've learned something new. We can actually add variables together. Imagine the possibilities. But I wonder what would happen if I would change, say, 4 into 4 with quotation marks, you know, as a string. All right, let's put on our mad scientist goggles and try it out. Oh, that's weird. 42? I mean, I know the answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42, but I didn't ask that. Let's see what happened. 
First, we typed num1 equals to 4, but since we have our quotation marks around 4, it would be considered a string and not a number. So our browser merely printed 4 on the screen, and then we added 2. But since our 4 is only a string, our browser didn't think it's a math problem and just added it to the screen, as is. So we could easily replace 4 to I love you. And if we will refresh the page, we can see that your browser loves you too. Browser, silly you. Math operators. In math, we have four basic operations that you can make. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. In the last lecture, we've already seen that we can add numbers in JavaScript. But aside from basic addition, we've got other math operations in JavaScript. Let's take a look at the rest of them. We have got subtraction. You simply make the minus sign. If you want to multiply numbers, don't write the x letter or something like that. Simply write star instead. That's multiplication. We can divide numbers as well. All you need to do is type a forward slash. So that's division. Now I've got a bonus for you. Let's say you want to increment a number by 1. So, of course, you can type something like that. But, if you are a lazy person like myself, you can do shorthand and do that. Or, something like that if we want a number to be decreased. The plus plus sign and also the minus minus will increment or decrement? Can we say decrement? Your number by one. It's short and dandy, and we will also see that a lot in our future, when we will encounter more complex stuff in JavaScript. Functions. Here's a true story. When I first came out from my parents' house, I had a, well, a little, tiny, really, mini, tiny, tiny problem. Well, you see, I hate cleaning. And when I first came out from my parents' house, nobody was cleaning for me. Ugh, <laughs> the horror. So after a day or two, I had tons of dishes in my sink. My clean clothes blend perfectly with my dirty clothes on my bed. My floor was completely a mess, and my two cats didn't really help. Meow. So the first thing I've done is to get me one of those robots who cleans the floor after you. A perfect solution for the lazy man in our era. And I was very glad. It was a repetitive task that I could have done myself many times that some sort of robot is doing for me. So if we go into our world of JavaScript, you may already think that there is a possibility to code the same code over and over again. And, if you are lazy like me, well, you will need to figure out how to make yourself a new robot. To this robot, the JavaScript people called functions. Instead of writing the same code over and over again, your function will basically store a segment of your code, and when you would like to execute it, you can call it, and the function will run. Like I always say, let's see some example and you will understand it better. Let's say we want to have a function that will congratulate us every time we enter our website. So, in order to write a function, all you need to write is function. So go ahead and write function. And then the name of your function, and just like your variables, you can name it whatever name you want. But it's a good practice to go with something meaningful of what your function needs to do. So if we want to congratulate your users, let's call it congrats. And then after the name, we need to open parenthesis and close parenthesis. By the way, those parentheses actually have a meaning, but for now, just leave it without anything inside. Then, open curly bracket and close curly bracket. And inside the curly brackets, we will type our code that we want to be executed when we call the function. We want our code to congratulate our users, so let's write something on alert. Let's see. Welcome to the Hamster Mobile website, where you can find a cheap vehicle for your beloved hamster. Well, I think we know what our next startup would be, right? I hope we don't have any competition. Hmm, I have to check this one. Oh, man, I cannot believe it. Apparently, there is a hamster mobile. Oh, my dreams just shattered like Windows 8. How can I recover from this one? Anyway, 
Let's also add a bit of code that tells us our congratulation alert has just been started. And also one text that our congrats just ended. Let's run our thing. Nothing shows. I wonder why. That's because we set our function, but we didn't call it, right? So let's call it. Just type anywhere outside of your function your name of your function, and then open parenthesis and close parenthesis, and then end with a semicolon. Save it, refresh your page, and bam! We've got our weird congratulations up and running. Now every time you want to use this thing, we wouldn't need to write our document right again, and our alert, and another time the document right. We just need to call our congrats function again, and that's it. Functions parameters. Do you know that game show called, Let's Make a Deal, that you have three curtains and you're supposed to guess which curtain has the brand shiny new car and which one has like a living adult llama? I always wondered if they actually have to take the llama afterwards and feed it, cleaning after it, be best friends with it, even if they're allergic to that llama, but they don't feel safe enough because that llama is a vicious llama. Anyway, today we will have the JavaScript version of the show, Let's Make a Deal. First, we will have three inputs typed button. Each and every one of them will represent a curtain. Curtain 1, Curtain 2, and Curtain 3. Now, let's make a room to our function. Create a new function called show curtain, but instead of leaving the parenthesis orphaned, type prize. Don't worry, we will explain everything in a moment. Just let me finish up this function. Now we will write inside of the function an alert with a U1 message, and also the same prize that we have inside of our parenthesis. All right, let's explain what is that prize thingy. Whatever we have in our parenthesis is called parameter, and our parameter is actually acting like a dynamic variable. That means, when we call our function, we will set the parameter in our parenthesis just like we set every variable. And then, our parameter will live and be used as long as the function is running. Alright, so, let's try something new, eh? Instead of calling our function like the last time, we can call it when our button is being clicked. So add to each button an attribute called, onClick, and set it to your function. And remember, our function asks for a prize parameter, so set it to whatever prize you want to get. And because we already use a double quotation mark for our HTML attribute, use single quotation mark instead to wrap our string. That should work. Alright, save it, refresh your page, and let's try to see what we've got here. Let's open our curtain number one. It's, it's, yes, a shiny brand new toothpick. Very handy. Now, curtain number two. The crowd roars with enthusiasm. It's, oh my, a colorful rubber band. Cannot wait to use it. Now, curtain number three. What would it be? Oh my, I cannot believe it. My all-time favorite, a living llama. Who would feed this animal? I cannot believe it. What a wonderful day. JavaScript function parameters? And a living llama? What more can an instructor ask for? Multiple parameters. Sometimes you can have functions that can hold parameters, but you will need to add another parameter as well. In our last example, we had one parameter that asked the prize money, and we had a message that tells the user what prize he won. But what if we want to add other information, like what curtain number the user just opened? If we would like to achieve this kind of task, we can add another parameter to our parenthesis. Just add a comma and type the extra parameter name you want to add. For example, to make our message cooler, we will add another parameter called curtain number. And then prompt in our message, you open curtain number. And then we will have our parameter, and we will continue our text with what he won like we've done in the last example. Now we will add the different curtain numbers to our buttons, so the parameter knows how to be set up. But note that the order of the parameter is important. If we have our curtain number as the first parameter, we will need to set it first as well. 
All right, let's test our curtains. Works. Yay! Return statement. In the previous lectures, we talked about functions and our functions just did something, right? We print things on the screen, press one button and a message popped out, stuff like that. But in some cases, you want your function to return some value, so you could use it later. That's why we have our return statement. Let's have an example. Write a function called basic addition that requests two parameters, num1 and num2. It will return the addition of both of them. Now we will call the function, and we will place the parameters 1 and 2. And we will expect to get the number 3 out, right? If we will run it right now, nothing will show. And this is because we didn't tell our function to do anything with it. It didn't print, and didn't even store it anywhere. Let's make a new variable, called result. And we will get the result right out of our basic addition function. And then, we will print result to the page. Let's save it and refresh it. And, bam, we've got it. We returned the result of the number we added, we stored it on a variable called result, and then we used the variable called result and printed it on the page. Calling function from another function. Okay, so you already know how to write a function and how to write a parameter for this function and even multiple parameters and even, God forbid, a return statement for this function. Now I'll show you a little trick that'll come in handy one day. You can actually call a function within a function. Let's try it out. Create a function called goodnight and another function called good morning without taking any parameters. Inside of the goodnight function, we would have document write and we will say goodnight. And in the good morning function, you guessed it, we will type good morning. And now we will have another function called start and we will call both functions from the start function. Right now, if we will refresh our page, nothing will happen, because although we called good morning and good night, we have not initiated the start function. Only when we call the start function, we'll see stuff going on. Let's do that. See? When we started the start function, we also ran both functions within it. Now, let's try to break our browser apart. Don't try it at home. Nah, kidding. You can. We will take the good morning function and place it within the good night function, and vice versa. And then, we will start by telling it to call good morning. And for the sake of readability, add a br tag to each write statement. We will expect the browser to go good morning and say good morning and then go to good night and say good night and then back to good morning, good night, good morning, good night, good morning, good night, good morning. It's supposed to get inside of some sort of limbo, leaving its wife and children and even its own sanity. Let's refresh it and, oh, wow, better than fireworks. If statement. Before I wanted to be a web developer, I always wanted to be a hamster tamer. You know, just like a lion tamer that works with lions, but with hamsters. You're supposed to tame them so they can do stuff. Anyway, sometimes I wonder what if I was going with my dream. And to make this thought come true, I will use my JavaScript skills. In JavaScript, you can have conditions in your code. For example, if x is true, then execute this code. If x is false, then do that code. If x is greater than y, then run those functions. Let's make it happen. To write an if statement, you should type if. Then open parenthesis. And then inside of those parentheses, you should write your condition. Then you should open curly brackets, and inside of those curly brackets, your code will be executed, only if the condition is true. So let's say we want to check if the number 2 is really equal to the number 2. You'll never know, right? Let's make two variables, num1 and num2, and we will set both to 2. So in the condition, type num1 equals equals num2. Note that we are having two equal signs and not just one equal sign. The reason for that is that if we type just one equal sign, the browser might get confused and think we want to set a new variable. So two equal signs is the way to go if you want to check if something is equal to something. 
Let's change our code here to just say, if I was a hamster tamer, my cow was broken. Because she might be someday. And let's run this thing. And indeed that's true. 2 is equal to 2, after all. And we have a broken cow just now. What if we want to check, rather, if 2 is not equal to 2? We should type instead of the two equal signs, let's erase that, we need to type exclamation mark followed by equal sign. That's not equal. So, let's test just that. Let's refresh that. And, yup, as we suspect, we don't get any message. That means 2 still does equal to 2. And, because we check for if it's not equal, the code doesn't fire. If we will change num1 into the number 3 and run the code again, we will see that the code runs perfectly, because 3 is not equal to 2. Let's learn another one. What if we want to check, rather, if 3 is greater than 2? We will change our condition to this funky angle bracket. If we want to check if 2 is greater than 3, we need to change it to the greater sign. Now we can check if one number is less than the other or equal. So if we will check the number 4, it won't run. 3? It won't run. 2? Bam! Got it. And we can also check if it's greater than or equal. Cool. Else and else if. Let's say you have a condition. For example, banana equals to the word banana. And when it does, you will have a function called chopping banana. Till now, nothing new, right? Banana is banana, and the code will be fired. And if I replace one of the bananas into a pineapple, the chopping banana function will not be fired, right? But let's say I want some other function to be fired if the condition is not true. What do I do? In this case, we need to type right after our last curly brackets an else statement and another curly brackets, and inside of those curly brackets, we can write our code. If we want, we can write another condition as well. We will write else if. And another condition, say, banana equals to cherry, and then another curly brackets. So in this example, the browser will first go into the first if, and ask the condition rather if the banana is a pineapple. If it's not true, then he will go to the next if, the else if, and ask, does a banana look like a cherry? Well, it doesn't. Oh, one more thing. You can have as many else ifs as you wish. We can have like uh, a gazillion else if. If some condition is true, it will fire the code inside of it and leave the whole bunch of ifs and else and else ifs alone. But if it doesn't, it will continue to ask until it gets to the last else. The else is the final try of our browser. If no if statement and no else if was fired, then our browser will be satisfied and go in. If your browser visited any condition, the else statement will not be fired. Switch. Who knows, maybe someday you will have your own web development company. And, as any other big company, it has its own vending machine. But we are not like any other big company, right? Our vending machine will be special. So we will have the, drumroll please, the vending pending machine. Our vending machine will make you pending. And that's it. No soda or anything, just wait for a while and go away. All right, so first, of course, we have to build our vending pending machine title. So we will add a few shticks in HTML. Now let's build the vending pending machine function. I will type a function named vending pending machine that asks for a pending time parameter and inside of our function, I will initiate a switch case statement. Let me type it down and I will explain it further afterwards.
so the browser comes to our function with a parameter in hand. Let's say it has the number 1 as a parameter value, then comes to the switch case statement. It sets the switch case with the pending time as 1, and then it searches for the right case. If case is 1, then it comes to the first one. If case number 2, then it fires the second one, and so on and so forth. It could even be a name like hamster. If the switch is equal to the case, then it will fire our code. If no case matches our cases, then it will fire our default case. But, of course, it's an optional case. Let's populate our cases. We will make a message function, so the vending pending machine could say to our users how many minutes they're supposed to wait. So I will write a function called pending message that gets a time parameter and then prints the message with the time parameter we got. Now we need to place our functions inside of our buttons. Alright, let's try our vending pending machine for the first time. Let's press button number 1. We will have to wait 1 minute, but we won't because I don't want to wait. Let's press number 4. We should get into our default case. We have to wait seven minutes? Oh no. Okay, you go to the next lecture. I'll wait here for seven minutes, I guess. For loop. Back in the days and still in the Simpsons episodes, there was a widespread punishment for naughty students, writing like a gazillion times what they did wrong, for example. I must not talk in class, or I won't forget to do my homework again, and stuff like that. So today we will break all the naughty students free, with our shiny new machine that writes lines for you. So, first of all, let's make our document look like a chalkboard. Alright, first things first. Let's see how we can repeat the same stuff over and over again. And to make that happen, we will use our brother from another mother, the for loop. The for loop is a technique that lets you loop through any code until you hit some sort of a counter. Let's write it down and I'll explain it further. All right, so to create a for loop, you have to write the word for and open parenthesis. Inside of the parenthesis, you have three sections divided by semicolons. The first section is supposed to reset your counter because the for loop is running until you hit that counter. So the first section is to reset your counter and you can call your counter whatever you like. I named it I. That's short enough, and reset it to zero. Right after, we have the second section. It's all about telling that for loop. If that condition's true, well, just keep looping, will ya? So I wrote i is less than 10, which is, in English, as long as our counter i is under 10, don't mention it. Just keep looping. And in the last section is the counter increment. After every loop, do the plus plus thingy, which, if you remember, means increment yourself by 1. So if our counter i is 0, after one loop it will change to 1, and then to 2, and then to 3, and so on. And every time our middle section is satisfied, our code here will keep on running. Alright, let's combine a little bit of for loops and functions and create ourselves a writing line machine. Writing line machine! Yeah! Yeah! Yeah, so first of all, we will write a function called write line machine with a for loop inside of it, and that function will take a parameter called line text, and we will let the for loop run for 10 times, for now. I will leave a comment now inside of the for loop. And now we will write a function that writes our text, and then we will insert it inside of our for loop, okay? So let's write it down. I will create another function called write, and this function will ask for a parameter called line text, and it will simply write on our document, the same value the parameter has. 
and we will insert our new function inside of our right line machine and link the parameter of the right line machine. All right, and now we will have another function that starts our machine called start machine, and we will just insert our right line machine inside of it with a parameter of line text. Now, we will have a new variable that holds a text. Let's say we want to repeat this text. I will never ride my hamster mobile to school ever again. I promise. And finally, we link it all together with a start machine and let it use our text variable. So our code goes to our start machine function with our text, travels to our right line machine function with our text, loops 10 times, and each and every loop he will visit our write function that just prints inside our document our text, which is, well, my forbidden rides on the hamster mobile. By the way, we can easily think of improving our machine and give it dynamic variables of the number of loops, like that. And that's it. Now we can trick our teachers and let our machine write lines for us. Array. So now we will learn what arrays are. Sometimes you will want to list stuff on your JavaScript, like a list of your usernames or dates or whatever. In order to do just that, you can surely declare a variable for every one of them, like var user1, var user2, var user3, and so on. But it will be completely inefficient, especially on a bigger list. So for that kind of task, we have arrays. Arrays will store a list, but on just one variable. Let me show you what I mean. I will create an array of names. All you need to do is type new and then array, and the array word is something you have to type. You cannot type whatever you want. That's a reserved name. You open parentheses, and inside of those parentheses, you write your variables. I will type an array of string names, as I said earlier. Big Tony, Amazing Bob, Cool Jeff, and Awesome Jane. Now let's say I want to print on the screen the name Amazing Bob. What do I do? I will write document write, and then inside of our parentheses, I will write name because that's the variable of our array. And then we want to access Bob. What we don't know is that each and every one of the array has a secret index number. And instead of one, it starts with zero. So Big Tony will be indexed zero. Amazing Bob will be indexed one. Cool Jeff will be indexed as two. And Awesome Jane will be three. So, to access Amazing Bob, we need to type index one, right? So, to make that happen, we will type square brackets and type one. Let's try it. And here we go. We have Amazing Bob right there. And if we wanted to get Awesome Jane printed on the screen, let's see what her index number. 0, 1, 2, 3. 3 is the index of Jane. Let's change it to 3 here. And we've got Jane. Now let's do something funky. Let's say our user, Awesome Jane, decided to change her name to Tammy. In that case, we would write names, open bracket, three, close bracket, to access her name, and then set it, just like we set a new variable, Tammy. And let's add another document write to see that, indeed, it changed over time. And yup, we've got it. Array tricks. All right, we have a few more tricks for arrays. We can add a new item with a push method. So let's say we want to add two more names, for example, Martha and George. Let's see if we've got it. Yep. We can also sort it alphabetically with a sort method. Let's see. Yep, sorted it out. And we can also reverse everything. Let's refresh it and see what we got. Yep, still got it. JavaScript on steroids. All right, so far we have learned lots of cool stuff, but right now it's time to take it up a notch. I'll write some advanced stuff, 
so bear with me, okay? All right. Do you know all of those movies that you have the villain and he takes the hero starring as Tom Cruise and he has, like, a bomb? And everyone will die if he doesn't place the right combination for a password? Well, today we will be the villain that's going to build this machine that prompts the password. And we will know if the password is valid or not. So let's build stuff on HTML. And let's style it a bit. After all, it's a special occasion. Now we will have a function, and we will call it check validation. It will check validation on the password combination, of course. Inside of our function, we will have a variable named password, and it will eventually get the value of the input type element who has the ID of password. Let's type document, get element by ID, value. So inside of password, we store the value of the input tag. Then we will have an if statement, checking if our combination is okay. So we will write password is not equal to, let's see, what's a combination even the Pentagon can't crack? Oh, one, two, three, four. That will do. And we will have an alert that says, Caution, password is incorrect. All right, let's place our function on the button. On click. And let's check if we type something. It says, Error. Yup, it does. Cool. Now, Note that we have a send button, so we have to send our form somewhere, right? Let me add a few sticks into our style tag. I added another class called left trans and add a few more modifications to our send item ID. Now, after we will succeed our password combination, the form will be sent to us, the villains. Let's add in the else statement. Far y, and it will take the ID of send item, so we will access the element of send item. And now, we will take the variable y and add a class called left trans. And let's try to fail only once. We got our message. Let's try again with our strong password. One, two, three, four. Whoop, we sent our form. Who knows where? Maybe to Mars. Homework. Many students try to take the course and then rush into the next. And after a day or two, they don't remember anything. Oh no. But if you really want to learn something, you have to learn it through your fingers. Shh, don't tell anyone, but I have something for you. I have prepared for you an absolutely free homework system. You will find there projects, questions, and many more. Just go to this link and claim your homework now. Now what? Congratulations! You accomplished this course. You heard lots of really bad jokes in this course. And I'm very proud of you. You might ask yourself, now that I've accomplished my first JavaScript course, what should I do now? How can I improve my web developing skills? Well, my young Padawan, now it's time to combine your JavaScript skills with some jQuery. I do have a jQuery course just for you. And, because you purchased this course, or in compensation for my bad jokes, I will give you 50% off all of my courses in Udemy. You can grab your coupon here. HTTP colon slash slash basicjavascript.gilad.me slash discount 50.